Hello, welcome everyone to uh, this Wednesday evening Grow Wild Nature Journaling Workshop. You can see a couple more attendees rolling in, but we will make a start. This is the first of a winter series that we're doing at the moment. Yes, I did say first, but I'll tell you more about that later. And today we're going to be learning a bit more about nature journaling and how to get started, what sorts of benefits we can get through doing nature journaling and how we can really increase our connection with nature and what benefits again that will have. So first up we will start with some introductions. Next slide please. My name's Isha Tiku and I'm the Grow Wild Engagement and Training Assistant here at the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. My work encompasses lots of different branches of Grow World activity, including our um, youth grant programme and training, obviously, as you can see here today, as well as things like our newsletter and all sorts of other things. <laughs> We're also joined here today with Chloe behind the scenes, who's controlling all the slides and bringing you all the technical wizardry that we need. Chloe, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi there. Thanks, Isha. So, yeah, I'm Chloe Booth and I'm the Grow World's Engagement and Training Officer and I work very closely um, with Isha on the Grow World programme. Um, so, yeah, so I'm behind the scenes. You can't see me, but um, I'll be keeping an eye on the Q&A as we go through um, and also interjecting with a few probably silly questions because I'm quite new to this world of um, nature journaling, not done it very much at all. Uh, but I think Isha, you've had quite a bit of experience at doing this yourself, haven't you? Yes, so my nature journaling journey sort of started in my previous work where I was a field biologist and as a field biologist you are trained to keep these meticulous notes and details about the environment you're in and about your research and species. And I very quickly learned that I actually got very distracted trying to keep my Phil's notes and research notes because I just wanted to record all these other things and had all these other questions and and wanted to use it as a journaling experience and you know reflections in these beautiful environments and it became a lot more than just the scientific research and so that's where my love for nature journaling really began and from that I've taught other sessions and done sessions with all sorts of ages because I just think it's one of the most amazing tools to get you really connected with nature and it's so individual and unique and you can really go right like really run wild with it however you want to go so I just think this is going to be hopefully a good session and get you inspired because there's a lot that you can do with it. Oh, sounds yeah. really exciting thanks Isha we can't wait to hear more. Mm. Next slide please. Before we get started, we will just run through a little bit of housekeeping. Some of you who might be new to Teams, uh, just let you all know that this session is being recorded, which to your benefit, hopefully, when you come and revisit, <laughs> because of all the helpful tips and advice, it will be put on YouTube. So you can come back and the link will be sent round after the session within the next week or so. Now, if you want to ask any questions, and we really encourage you to answer some of the questions that we're going to be asking, you can do this via the Q&A box, which you should find at the top of your screen there. Or you can also see it near the hand on the left of the screen. So it's a question mark with two speech bubbles. And if you press on that, that's the Q&A box. Now, we do ask that you don't put any personal information into your questions the chat is monitored by chloe and anything that isn't appropriate to be published won't get published of course we really want you to be able to join in and you know we're a community a very friendly grow wild community so please yeah ask your questions just nothing too personal please <laughs> and also for accessibility if you want to turn on live captions you can do that so you can have uh sort of whatever i'm saying written on the bottom of your screen. If again you go to the top, you can see three dots and you click on that and down at the bottom of the list you'll be able to see turn on live captions. So if you need that, that is there for you. And finally, if you've got any concerns during the session or after the session about any content you've seen, anything like that, hopefully you'll be OK. But you can contact our uh, manned inbox at hello at growworlduk.com. I think that's all the housekeeping. <laughs> the next Great. slide, please. 
So hopefully by the end of this session, you're going to understand a bit more about who keeps nature journals and why they might keep them. We're going to understand how nature journaling can be beneficial to your well-being. This is a really key one, one that's very important, especially at the moment going into winter where everything can feel a bit more gloomy, especially if you're someone who loves to spend all your time outdoors and all of our light has gone away. And finally, you're going to get some simple tips and inspiration to help you get started. So you'll be ready to roll. Maybe you'll even feel ready to buy everyone a nature journal themselves for Christmas. We'll see. <laughs> get the whole family involved. That's a great yeah. idea. I'm adding that to my uh, shopping list. Then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've done it before multiple times. I can't. I feel like I can't do that one again this year. <laughs> so next slide, please. So we'll start off with a nice meaty question about what is nature journaling? Come to this session now, tell me what it is. So nature journaling is this brilliant middle ground between art and between science and mindfulness and self-expression really and it just is a place where this can all connect. But it's sort of more than just that, it's more than just writing and it's more than just having pretty pictures that you've drawn or you know taken photos of and stuff. It's it's a way of thinking and it's a way of um it's a way of it's a skill really that you practice and can train yourself and is observational and when you go out and about in nature and therefore you're creating these deeper connections and facilitating different thought patterns as you go out there and the more time that you spend in nature of course the better hopefully for your well-being so we'll run through a historical example of how nature journaling has sort of progressed to your next slide please So historically, the written word and drawings was the only way to really make these recordings because we didn't have the same technologies that we now have. And this, so you'd get these meticulous journals of people's travels and you'd have letters between people because, you know, if I went out in the park and I saw a mushroom that I was thought was really cool and I wanted to ID it, I couldn't just take a picture of it on my iPhone and use Seek or upload it instantly to Facebook group who might be able to help me with my IDing. I would need to record down all the details of it somewhere so when I got home I could maybe look in my books and work it out so you need to record the shapes of it, the textures, maybe the smells and you'd have to do this all in some sort of note form or remem mem uh, remember it which I always think I will remember things really well. You never remember things as well as you think you will. <laughs> so this was one of these, it was historically everyone had to write all these, these different things down if you could could write even. And a really brilliant example of this is, um, from, or example I have here, is a woman called Elsie Wakefield. Now, she worked for Kew Gardens and we have a really great collection of her notes. She ended up becoming the first female head of mycology, so she was very pioneering pioneering in her time and is in general a really inspirational woman so I would recommend looking her up in her field she's done some incredible work and you can see here how she's written some notes and some diagrams and some drawings from when she was out in the field and these ones specifically about the connections between uh, beech trees and fungi so you can see lots of different notes here and she's written down the dates that she's done these in. And if we go to the next slide, please. We also can see that she used to do these brilliant watercolour field drawings when she was out and about. And this was again as an ID features. You can see they're quite detailed, but they're not so detailed, like proper, proper botanical art at this point. She just did these out in the field and you can see the one on the edge there has got a great little cross um, like cut through a cross section of what she was looking at. She really looked at how they connected into the ground and these were done as I said in the field. They wouldn't need to be necessarily real um, you know real artistic adventures. These were quickly done and this really just captured the fine finer elements of the species themselves. Wow, they're really amazing and the colours as well and um, I think as you you mentioned Isha, we all take it so much for granted that we can sort of capture things through photography now um, and you know we take that so for granted and to think that 
Yes, yeah, so if you went out and saw something and you wanted to share it with somebody, you really would need to find a good way to record all those details, wouldn't you, without without having a camera? It's really amazing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even now they've got cameras, they don't capture all those details. So the brilliant thing about doing these drawings is you can capture really fine ones by doing your own zoom in and, mm. and like picturing what it is that you're doing. And you can get things that if it was covered in mud, you can then pretend you've cleared it off and you can reimagine it amazingly. So there's yeah. a lot of different ways to do that. Again to the next slide, please. Now, what I've shown you there was a lot more on the field journaling side in comparison to the nature journaling side. And I'm just going to clarify what the difference is between them both, because there are quite fundamental differences, although they can end up looking very similar. So field journaling is sort of qualitative evidence by researchers or scientists when they're out in the field. And when I say that, it means that they're doing research in um, out kind of in the environment in which they're working rather than inside a lab with nice controlled conditions that are kind of out in the outdoors. In my instance, I was running around uh, rainforest a bit. <laughs> um, and your field journals will be usually focused on a particular research subject or an environment rather than just everything possible. Now sometimes all these recordings were done with everything possible but most of the time you've got a specific question or a subject or an environment that you're just researching and that's how you focus the content for your field journal. Now in comparison nature journaling is a lot more personal. These are your personal notes and you get to define the purpose of why you're doing them. You don't have a research question to have to keep going back to and thinking around. So this can be completely up to you. Your imagination can go wild and you don't have to worry even about ever showing these to anyone. <laughs> these can be completely up to you, especially you know, with journaling, things can feel very personal if you're making some feel like connections with your emotions and how you're, you know, the things that you're seeing. So they're very, it's up to you what you include. And nature journaling is also a lot more about nature connection rather than trying to find the answers to lots of different questions. Your main objective is, you know, just being out there. You can have other objectives, which we'll go into later, but nature connection is the main goal rather than understanding the hypotheses you're possibly researching. It's really interesting. Someone's actually just put a question um, in, the, in the chat, mm. Isha, asking um, how do you define nature, which is a really big question and um, quite <laughs> philosophical there. Um, but I guess in terms of, you know, how would you approach that term in in regard to nature journaling? Is it kind of are you thinking generally of the natural world as a whole when you say nature? <laughs> Again, I think that's a very individual question. I would classify myself as nature and humans in general. So if I went to a park, I would include the interaction field between mm -hmm. people and you know the plants and fungi and animals and all the microorganisms that we can't see so again i think that one's really up to you about how deciding you want to define nature um sometimes people will define it as kind of being out in green spaces in general so spaces that aren't um potentially not man-made maybe curated and looked after by humans but they're not inside buildings and stuff so it kind of depends it's a <laughs> there's a very philosophical question I love that <laughs> yeah I feel <laughs> like we could maybe do a whole talk about how yeah, we would define that separately you should. <laughs> <laughs> thank you that's a great question if anyone else has got any answers or any definitions that they want to then please add those into the chat as well which I would love to see Liam so you can understand a bit about field journals now for scientists, kind of, and you can understand a bit more about nature journaling, but why is this relevant to you? Why should you start? Well, we know that if you nurture your nature connection, nature connection, and you sort of feed your minds, there's this whole, whole host of well-being benefits. So um, yeah, like seeing in this image particularly, like the watering can and sort of feeding your mind, letting yourself flourish because of these great well-being benefits. So let's have a look at some now. Next slide, please. Now, these are just a cut. I mean, this is a not a full list but these are a few that we've come across and I really love this sculpture 
that is actually Accu Gardens being shown at the moment. And this is, I feel, a perfect representation of how I feel after I come out of a nature journaling session <laughs> where I've just like melted in to the nature and to the environment around it. And you can just see, you feel like you become one and you reconnect with the environment around you. Your, you know, those daily stresses that we all have kind of melt away. So I really like this one and I hope that represents as well maybe one of the reasons that you would like to get started. But first of, on this list is the increase in dopamine. So as I said, nature journaling is, is a tool and it's a technique that you can use in a way of thinking as opposed to, you know, just one answer to everything. But the curiosity that you build by starting a nature journal and going out and you have your own objectives and you're learning about different things, um, the curiosity that you build starts um, releasing dopamine in your brain and dopamine is the positive reward chemical. So it's the one that makes you feel good when you have something that's good and exciting. So this curiosity is great for you and it's going to make you feel good, which of course we all need to feel good. So <laughs> that's one of the one reasons you could start nature journaling. Next up is improving your observational skills. So as I said, observational skills, it's a skill. You need to practice it and you might, everyone always says about, oh, I've really you know, got my eye in here. And if you're, say more recently, if you're out on a fungi walk, for instance, you get these teeny tiny ones that you can't see as soon as you get your eye in because you've started observing in a different way, you suddenly see how many fungi might be around that particular tree or up or down. And, you know, everything else just sort of starts jumping out at you. And you think some people are really good at observing versus some are not as you know skills and it. it's a skill so you can keep practicing and that's what nature journaling can help you develop because you're going out there however many times to go and do that yeah, that's great I think I could do with improving my observational skills <laughs> sometimes <laughs> so yeah I'm not very good so I think that's what good reason for me to get started <laughs> Exactly. And next up, we've got mindfulness, which is something that gets spoken about a lot in a lot of different ways. So this is all about bringing yourself back to the present moment and connecting back with your senses and, you know, not worrying about all these future things that might happen, past things that have happened. It's just, you know, what's going on around me right now? You could be lit if you're outside, you could be looking at this particular leaf and that's it. And you're just a again linking to your observational skills you can then start to observe your own thoughts better which is a really really good skill to have I mean if you're like me I struggle with mindfulness just sat down in one place I love to do more sorts of movement meditations and that's like walking out in nature and then reconnecting with these um, different observations is really helpful for me for grounding <laughs> um, I also would say that nature journaling is a great space to organise your thoughts and that links with journaling itself as a you know a tool that gets used for you to organise any busy thoughts that you have. It's also a place here that you can record your thoughts and your feelings about a space and a place as well as your observations as well as maybe your ID skills and all the beautiful things that are going on around you. So it provides this really you know, one place potentially that you can record all of these things because being out in certain spaces does make you feel different ways and you can really look into that a bit more and think about that a bit deeper. We always say, just dig deeper. What more can you think about in this sort of area? Another one is decreasing stress. Okay, almost all through this list now. <laughs> Decreasing stress. Again, we all need it. It's been a really stressful time of our lives, I would say. And I think linking back to just spending more time, spending more quality time in nature, not just going into autopilot when you go on your daily walk, getting your steps in. It's about actually, I'm out here now and how can I make the most of this and really connect with what's going on around me. And with things like forest bathing, I know there's been studies that shown your heart rate decreases. It's a lot of stuff that's gone into understanding why this has been a decrease in stress. And finally, and I kind of have to, and I say I don't have to say this, but I'm, of course, I'm an environmental educator. <laughs> so learning is one of the purest joys that we have. And you can just use this as a tool to just keep learning. Be a student and it's great to ask questions, to not know, to find out how much you don't know, which it turns out is always loads. <laughs> so you just can keep learning and you can use it as a tool to keep doing that. 
and as you're learning you create all these new neural networks between your different brain like areas in your brains brains just the one brain <laughs> and you get to something called neuroplasticity you increase your neuroplasticity which is to do with these new connections forming which is really good for things like memory and cognition so keep learning be a lifelong learner and nature journaling is a fabulous tool for you to continue to do that yeah it's great and I think particularly you know coming out of a period when we've you know through Covid we've had lockdowns and um, experiencing new things has not been the same we haven't had the same yeah. opportunities so we probably could all do with doing a bit of this to just to flex those brain muscles a bit more I think. <laughs> yeah I definitely definitely agree so hopefully these are just some of the many benefits that you can have there's things about like being connected to place and space as well if you want to connect more to your local area find out more what's going on there we've not even discussed how cool it is to just keep watching all the different seasons coming in and going through and feeling connected in that way there's a whole host of benefits and again these are just some that I've added here on the slides and if you could think of any more again do add them into the question and answer box should we go to the next slide please yeah I'm excited to see how we put this into action now <laughs> so there you go how do I get started it's kind of can be quite a daunting thing to think actually okay you've told me all the benefits I want to get started I need some practical ways and how to actually do that so number one understand why it is you'd like to get started now as I keep saying it's a very unique experience for all of you and every attendee here tonight might have a very different reason or multiple reasons as to why they would like to so I touched on mindfulness and what benefit that can be and about developing your observational skills just curiosity in nature and wanting to faci facilitate that or maybe it is you just want a new hobby it's just that there's a gap to be filled you just would like to start something new and see how where it takes you and how it can develop and just learning new skills is just great anyway so maybe that's why you want to do it or maybe you want to connect with friends and family maybe you want to model this type of um this type of thing with to your children something like that it's a great activity to do with kids i think you can learn a lot from kids when you go out into nature and watch them and see how they interact with different things so i'd really recommend that if that's a uh, thing for you um one of the reasons i initially started although it, you know my reasons changed and as you'll understand and learn your reasons will change too i really wanted to improve my id skills just at that moment my id skills are sometimes lacking my memory is sometimes poor and so i just wanted to i knew if i start drawing things a bit more and paying more attention and having to note it down then my id skills would improve with names and scary latin names that i was trying to remember so yeah these are just a few reasons why you might want to get started, but understand why you want to and even, you know, use yourself, not use yourself, just use it and hold yourself accountable. Um, maybe write it at the front of your journal so you can remind yourself this is why I want to do it and you'll feel a bit more motivated maybe to go out if you're lacking some motivation. So like setting an intention, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah next slide please i think <laughs> so next up you've set your intention you know why it is you want to go out there you know what you're going to potentially focus on more than other things you want to choose a time and choose a place a safe a place you feel safe in very comfortable in um by choosing a time and scheduling it in even being like this saturday morning at 10 a.m i'm going to go out to the park for an hour and i'm going to do some nature journaling you know you set yourself up to go and do this activity because like it is a hobby um, something you sort of need to plan for maybe it just allows yourself to really build that into your day and then and therefore make it something that you are going to go out and do and fulfill and continue in your nature journaling so choose a time choose a place number two <laughs> I'm just thinking that like, Isha if um because I know everybody is really busy but perhaps could a way to approach this also be that you think about uh little windows you've got in your day like maybe if you're a person who walks through a park maybe on the mm -hmm. way to work or school you could kind of maybe use that as your 
you know, sort of arranged slot, if you know what I mean. Would, do you think that could work as well? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, things down the road, you could in theory do it in the dark if you felt safe and you could look at very different things. It doesn't just have to be a visual, visual things that you're looking at. You could do textures and smells and sounds. So there's a whole host of different ways that you could do it. And I think factoring it into those different times of your day is a really brilliant idea. Yes, I would also say don't need to always do it outside. You could go for your walk, do some observations, take some pictures, come home and do your some more um, in your journal and things like that. So it doesn't all have to be done outside. If it is a walk that you need to get done at this time, maybe you're walking your dog, then you can take your you can do your observations then and then bring them back with you. Good tips. Good tips. <laughs> Number three. And this is kind of a cruel one for me to say, but just wrap up warm and get stuck in. <laughs> now, some of you will feel like, yeah, OK, cool. I've, I feel like I know what I'm going to do. I know that if I go outside, some, I know what I'm interested in. I'm going to go out here. This is what I'm going to look at. This is how I'm going to do it. Um, and, you know, that's the guidance you need. I appreciate and not everyone is going to feel like that. And we will run through an example in a next, the next slide even. But first of all, you just get stuck in. And I think the key, one of the key things about nature journaling is asking questions. Just keep asking questions. When you go into a space and you maybe get drawn to something that you want to investigate a bit more, ask some questions. They don't need to be answered. They might never be answered. But then that will make you ask some more questions and maybe that will ask one that you actually do want to go home and research or it might be something that you ponder a bit and then you go and ask someone later on. So just keep asking questions, feel drawn to spaces and investigate, pretend you're an investigator even. <laughs> and this is just, yeah, get stuck in, use all your senses. You try and use, I mean, use your common sense as well and don't just put things in your mouth, please don't try and ingest anything but use all your other senses <laughs> smell things listen to things and how listen to the soundscape of the area you're in <laughs> now for the next slide next slide please for those of you who are maybe struggling a bit more and you think oh, I don't actually know where to start there we shall you've just said get stuck in and that's a bit mean <laughs> I'm going to set you off with the task and the task simply is Go find a tree. That can be your first task with your nature journal. And you'll very quickly come to realise you could probably spend hours, probably a month with this tree in your nature journal because there's so many different ways to go about it. And I'm going to try and just talk you through some of the different questions and things you could ask and do. So you start off and you get to your tree. You found your tree, it's maybe down the road or in your park. Maybe you've chosen one specifically out of a group of ones. I don't know. Now look at the textures. Look at how many different textures that you might have in the tree itself or on the tree and use, as I said, use all of your different senses. So feel this. How does this feel in comparison to something else? Now look how the light might come through the leaves or if there are no leaves, look how the light and the sky is very distinctive against the branches. The smell maybe the ground underneath you. You might hear all the leaves as you walk around it. So many different things. Zoom in, look at it as one, you know, really up close at different textures and look in between the bark, what's growing there. Maybe there's moss or lichens there. And then go stand really far away from it and look at it as it stands around everything else. What is what's surrounding it? Record this down. If there's light that's coming in, see how the light hits it at different angles. You could go at completely different levels. I mean, if it's not wet and you've got good clothes, you don't mind getting a little bit muddy in this weather. <laughs> you could lie down on the floor and look up at the tree. If you're able, you could climb up the tree and look down. It's all fine. <laughs> you could look up from right at the trunk. You could you can see where I'm going with this. You can do all sorts and just keep asking these questions. What's going on underneath the ground, underneath your feet? What fungi connections and mycelial networks do you think are going on underneath it all? And how does this tree connect with the other trees around it? Well, how far do the roots ex go down and expand themselves? There's so many different things. If you're with kids, and now this is where, you know, it might sound silly, but you really can have fun with it. If you're with kids or not, you know, ask yourselves, what does this remind you of? 
Now, me and Chloe spoke earlier and we said that this picture on the right looks just like an elephant's foot. It's, it so know, does. <laughs> it could have toenails and it could be an elephant's foot. And from that, I thought, well, elephants have trunks and trees have trunks. I wonder who first thought about that. If anyone knows the answer, please tell me. I keep coming back to this thought <laughs> and think how grand the two of them are. Things like that. You could go, you know, and investigate if the tree had a voice. What voice would it have? If you were taking drawing or making drawings of this tree, if you cut it in half, what was it going to look like? Or if you cut it straight down again, what would this look like? You could change the colours that your diagram or drawings are of. So you, you can see how much there would be to explore just from finding a tree and then just really going at it from different angles and different ways. There's so many different different ways to explore things. And I think it's, a, it's have fun with this, have, enjoy it. And this really senses you back to, you know, you're centering yourself to your space, to your place. Just really focusing in, isn't it, really? And I can see how if you were, you know, even in quite an urban environment, you know, you can usually find a nice street tree somewhere and you could focus in on that and kind of all the background noise and hustle and bustle mm. might sort of zone out for you as you focus in on the different aspects you mentioned. So, yeah, really. exactly. And this is just at the tree. I mean, once you've done this, you could go and compare it to another tree or compare it to something else that maybe you found on the tree or under it. It can go on and on. You can observe people and things and their interactions maybe with your space. Um, there's so uh, so many different things and I just I really believe that winter is a brilliant time if you're new to nature journaling because things have slowed down a bit more and you can really start honing in those observational skills before you get the big spring burst where suddenly and I will find this every spring but suddenly there's just so much to try and note down and you then really have to be selective about what it is you want to actually look at and research and not research but just explore and put into your nature journal and record down because there's so many things but in winter you can really have a few less things to focus on and, and therefore really go into a lot of detail with these ones and really utilize that sort of observational skill set that you're going to be developing. Uh, somebody's put in the chat uh, Isha, um, ask, they've asked the question are there any nature journaling groups run by Q especially if you're new to this and I think you're going to touch on in a little bit why you might choose to either do it with people or some of the benefits as to why you might want to do this as, as a sort of solo um, activity um, but I was just going to mention that there are absolutely loads of resources online aren't there as well because we're covering quite a lot of content today but we know there's absolutely loads of information out there so um, I don't know specifically about groups but there's plenty out there. <laughs> Yes, definitely. There's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of um, groups and communities online, even like spanning across the world. There's a nature journaling week, which um, I think if you look up, you'll be able to find. And again, that brings a lot of different experts in their areas, ones who are far more veteran than I am about <laughs> their nature journaling and skills and journeys and different ways to explore it. So there is a good set of resources that you can um, look at online. But Yes, there are. We'll talk about doing nature journaling with people in a few slides time. Cool. So the final thing that I would like to, or the final step, not the final thing I'm going to talk to you about. The final step is once you've you know explored these different ways, as I said, it's not just about writing and it's not just about, you know, drawing pretty pictures. Experiment with how you record. It's a personal thing. You can go really go wild with it. Um, I like one of the ones is completely banning pencils and pens for recording information and just using things that you can find outside or mud and you know scraping leaves into your thing and seeing how you can make those um, marks in your paper or whatever it may be. You also could press flowers or leaves especially if they've fallen rather than picking them um, and these can be things that you can stick in your journal. You can do a collage, you can record from different angles, as I said before with the trees about sort of slicing it through and trying to imagine it in a different way like that. Um, photos are a very accessible way that we can do these things now. I mean, your nature journal doesn't have to be a physical thing in front of you. Um, it could be a completely online thing or maybe it will be your observations and you could put them into um, onto a social media page. I mean, there's nothing stopping you if that's the way that you want to do it. You could do maps, you could record audio recordings and I think that's a really 
brilliant one to create a soundscape. You could monologue how it is that you're thinking and you're feeling in that space. Um, kind of people always forget about the audio side of uh, of recording and um, they think it's kind of more just a visual thing. But audio is a really great way, especially for accessibility. You could do bark rubbings or leaf rubbings where you put your paper over and then you go over it like that and then it's another way to get really great fine detail and it's a really great way to get textures onto your paper if you feel like you're struggling to um to draw or to get those down you could record from the same spots every week or every month and you can see how that changes and that's maybe one way you could do it and finally but not you know the last thing that you can do there's so many different ways and again if you've got any ideas please do share them in the chat box because um this is the sort of thing that everyone's imagination can come together as one and you might inspire someone else but finally storytelling so you could create like a storyboard or can you imagine if you were trying to describe that situation or that thing to someone who couldn't see it at all and how would you describe it to them or how would you describe different smells and things like that if you were going to maybe go a bit more abstract and just say well if we go back to our tree example what stories have happened around this tree it doesn't have to necessarily be completely around um around the nature itself it could be something that you're including next to the nature and how does that change the story there's a load of different ways that you could go about it but don't just stick yourself um into just writing and to just drawing try it in different ways and see how you feel and see how some things you're going to love some things you're going to hate but it's that experimenting and it's that keeping things novel that makes your nature journal exciting it doesn't need to be perfect I really like that idea of maybe um, being in the same space or charting a particular maybe tree um, throughout the year at different points because it's mm. almost it, I think that could be quite anchoring in terms of when you look back over the year and what you've observed um, and, yeah. see, and keeping a record of those changes because sometimes I, I think you tend to think oh what did I do over the last six months mm. and having that kind of reference in, in a you know a, na a natural way looking at the something in nature but also quite anchoring for yourself to sort of chart what you've been doing is quite nice. Yeah, definitely. And I think even with things, I mean, every time the season, new seasons come in, it's so amazing and I always feel like it's the first time I've ever seen a tree that's <laughs> colours and yeah. you know leaves have changed colour. And it's not because I've forgotten or I don't know, but it suddenly just feels so new. And it's great to just recall that throughout the year and you can look back on it at different times and mm. remember the excitement of different seasons changing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Next slide, please. So we've got a couple of do's and don'ts for when you just want to get started. And some of these are in from if you've seen the blog post, they're included in the blog post as well. And they're just as an extra bit of guidance and tips for before you get out there, which I hopefully can have convinced you all to do now. So number one is just go for it. You don't need to start at the beginning of the month. You don't need to start at the beginning of the year, even though both of those things are coming up soon. So if you are that person, then <laughs> you, you, you actually does, does. This is great timing. But you don't need to start when you found the perfect book. You can do recordings on anything. You do on some old recycling and go outside and get some recording done and then, you know, put them all together and stitch them together afterwards. So just go for it. Don't worry about things needing to be perfect. I would also say do set yourselves some prompts and some themes if you feel like you're lacking inspiration or you don't know what it is you want to go out and look for, especially in winter where you might think there's less to go and see. Some things uh, I've done before have been go and find, I usually make them into sort of like uh, kind of searches for different things and then once I find things I feel a bit more motivated and can go and do a bit more recording so one of the things I like to do is think, go and find moss that's in really weird places or I've done with children before is go and find uh, sticks that are in different letter shapes <laughs> things like that so you could focus on lichens and I know I've spoken a lot just about plants and fungi we're obviously all about our plants and fungi but you can encompass all sorts of nature the animals um, everything else in between maybe footprints and droppings and all of that so you could maybe go and look for feathers is a really beautiful one to go and see and different feathers see if you can id them you can stick them into your journal so there's a lot of different themes and prompts that you could go for and just pick one go for it 
go and see and it will send to you very quickly, especially if you're searching for something. Now, if you have any good ones, again, and I keep saying this and hopefully you are, I haven't, <laughs> can't see the chat at the moment, but uh, share one in the chat for us. So if you've got any good prompts or themes. Hmm. Next up, I'd say, oops, sorry, Chloe. Mm -hmm. Can we go back to the do's? Oh. Sorry. Sorry, have I skipped? I have, haven't I? Let me just see right. if I can go back. There we go. I'm getting ahead <laughs> of myself. Yeah, I probably have seen the time. I should start speeding up a little bit. Um, do have fun with it. So your journal shouldn't feel like a chore. Don't say I've got to do this every single day for the next year. That's never going to work. You'll feel unmotivated and then you won't continue it. So have fun with it. And do it when you fancy doing it. But as I said, setting a time and a date can help you along a bit. And for the final for the do's is do look back on your journal and celebrate what you've created. So don't just do it once and then never look at it again at your different pages. It's really great to see how these interlink and that's how you get these deeper levels of thinking which really develop your learning and your observational skills. So if you look back and you can start drawing out connections and I'll see in a couple of slides how that links a bit more. Next slide please. <laughs> so don't be put off by the winter weather. Wrap up warm. Obviously, as I said earlier, you can go inside and take your recordings and your observations inside and do it. So don't, don't freeze as well. <laughs> or maybe you just want to wear very thick gloves, whatever you fancy. But don't be put off by the winter weather. The winter's a great season to start. Don't forget to record the date, location and weather when you start your session. Now, this is really important if you are making those connections long term. You don't know what those types of recordings, you know, you don't know where your journal might end up. I didn't know that my photo of my journal would end up in a session to all of you <laughs> tonight. And there are other ways that they can be used in the future. So just putting down these really simple details such as the date, the location means if someone else finds it, it might be a very helpful information in future years to come. Don't think that you need to be really deep in the wilderness to start. So, you know, a park or a garden will do beautifully. You don't need to be out in the Lake District to get started, although I'm sure if you did ever go or lucky enough to go visit Lake District and you had your journal, you'd have lots to write down, but you don't need to do that. You can do your local area and even doing about your local area is even more brilliant because you get to observe all these seasonal changes. So. I don't think that you need to be somewhere really fancy to get started anywhere local will do and don't put pressure on yourself or your journal to be perfect I mean some people just don't even start the first page just skip straight to the second one because you don't want to make it all messy don't even worry about it don't put your pressure being perfect enjoy being a student enjoy asking questions next slide please so I'm just going to finish off with a story about a guy called, well his first name was Frank, but he liked to go by Nigel, Nigel Hepper. And this is how your observations and your journaling can have an impact and can re record things that you may not realise at the time you're recording, but later have a really big impact. So Nigel Hepper was a botanist at Kew, but he actually started recording the first um, like spring flowers that would come through. He did it with a lot of different species. So the first flowering day, he would sometimes record when the first leaf would come out. He would also potentially record when the first fruit would ripen. He'd make these different observations and he'd note them down. And he started this when he was 17. So he really just was interested in ha having a look at these observations from a very young age. You don't have to be 17 to start, don't worry. Um, and from this, he started just when he moved, he eventually moved to London and he started this in Richmond in his own garden. When he started work at Kew, he worked for Kew for 20 years and, you know, in his lunch breaks and things like that, he again would go out and he would record throughout the year when different plants were coming into flower and things like this. He did this for 20 years whilst he was at Kew and really makes me feel like I should utilise my lunch breaks better. <laughs> but one of his key findings, and he didn't realise this at the time, so he worked for Q between 1953 and 1973. At the time, he was just doing these because he enjoyed it. It was his hobby. But he had actually started to record some of the first impacts of climate change on 
plants and what impact they were having on their flowering, um, which was at the time wasn't, you know, climate change wasn't really on everyone's radar, but we then had this historical records of how this, um, how this change has happened over time in this little, potentially it was going to be a bit of a lost period, not knowing when these things happen because not many people were making these um, making these observations. And one of the most striking ones that he had started in the 50s was of this wild daffodil, which um, you can find all over. It, what he noted was between the 1950s and in 2008, that this flower was coming up 52 days earlier than it had done in the 1950s. So wow. you can see that's a huge amount yeah. of um, change in terms because some, I mean, some plants, they will only go by something called photo period, which is about the days, um, how long, how much daylight they get. So they weren't impacted, but ones that were being affected by temperature, much like this wild daffodil, were being impacted in that way. So just to say, you don't know what, your records might be showing if you keep them up for a particularly long time. Yeah. Fascinating and gosh yeah to think that 52 days it was a difference that's huge isn't it? Yeah yeah and then I mean some people each year will say like oh this is ripening a lot earlier than last year and you can see how the temperature year on year impacts but having that really long term um, observation is was so important in this case because we just wouldn't have known that huge amount of um, difference and this is something that Q continues to monitor with different species that Nigel had started which is quite cool. Yeah. Cool so I think that was the almost the final bit but I would just like to say I hope you enjoy this and I really hope that you feel inspired to get out and get started and if you do and you want to share you're not keeping it completely personal then please do tag us on our Instagram on our Facebook on Twitter and use the hashtags either hashtag grow wild or hashtag nature journaling and or both at the same time please actually would be the best and that would be um, we'd really like to build a community of people going out and doing this because it really is so great for your well-being and so great for your nature connected nature connection mm -hmm. and a sneak peek you are the first people to get to know this so this is a great you're in a great position <laughs> next uh, not next week, the week after next week, so in two weeks time on Wednesday the 8th of December at 5.30 we have got another winter webinar for you called Understanding and Identifying Fungi and now this is some another kind of will build up your skill set even more with your nature journaling so they kind of work quite well together and um, we are joined by a foraging educator and fungi fanatic um, who is called Mark Williams. He's a really, really interesting and knowledgeable person and he's all about building in nature connection but also from a, a foraging element. So he's got a lot of amazing knowledge and it's going to be a really great session. So I hope you can join us same time in two weeks time. You can sign up very similar ways. There'll be more details coming out on our social medias. I think tonight if not definitely tomorrow yeah that sounds really exciting and it'd be really fantastic to see if you do go out and do some nature journaling you know it'd be so great to see what you get up to and to share um some of your recordings with us i'm really excited to you know see that and um i hope you'll 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 share your experiences with us yeah please do and please i mean if you're interested in this and would like another session on it then let us know because we are very open to do maybe a spring nature journaling session and can talk through some of the different things that you could be looking out for then how you've developed i mean it's all up for grabs so if you have any recommendations or requests for training we would love to hear them we're kind of in a period where we're developing our training programs at the moment. The winter season is sort of when we get the chance to do that. So please do connect with us. We're a Grow World community and let us know what, what you think, what you would like. We're here, we're all ears. 
Yeah, and there's been some really nice comments coming in on the Q&A as well. Some really quite moving stories actually about how people um, have, have been out in nature and it's helped them to connect and think, reflect uh, when they've lost somebody that they love as well. There's one person who's put in that they were given a book by their sister who died and they used that to do their nature journaling. So some oh. really quite moving stories. Um, oh, that's so thank brilliant. You, yeah. Thank you for sharing those experiences. Um, also, somebody else who says they usually cycle, so they like to write in their journals the next very first thing they do the next day so that's quite a good tip if you're right. you know doing your reflections whilst you're traveling um mm. and so that's uh, that was great thank you um and also some people have asked uh, whether the the slides will be available from this session um so just to say this uh, we did mention at the start this is being recorded um so we will be posting the recording to youtube it will take a few days for us to get it ready um but you will be able to catch it again mm. Yes. Also, I mean, if you would like to contact and get the slides, if you need like a screen reader or some any reason like that, then you can contact us and go to our main um, email address. So hello at growworlduk.com and um, you can get hold of one of us and we can send them along, I'm sure. Yeah. And if you're not on social media, just to say if you don't use social media, but you would like to share what you get up to, um, please do drop us an email as well. So the email address for Grow World, it's hello at growworld dot co dot uk um so we is that correct have i said that right are you sure it's hello, hello, hello grow grow world world UA. dot com dot sorry <laughs> <laughs> we just we've got it on the first slide so i will pop that back up at the very end if you'd like to send us an email uh, rather than socials that's also would be wonderful um, so yeah yeah just skip back through some of the slides now just so you can uh, get that one Sorry, flicking. <laughs> it was near the start. Oops, there we go. Hello yeah. at growworlduk.com is the way to email us. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We really hope you've enjoyed it. And as I said, do get in contact with any other ideas. We really appreciate you all turning up. And I hope you're feeling inspired to get outside and enjoy some nature journaling this winter. We hope yeah. to see you in two weeks time as well. It's, as I said, there'll be lots of really cool things going on. So do keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you, Isha. And thanks everybody Very for well. joining. <laughs> Bye.